Good, good evening, everyone. And I say that because we have audiences across the globe joining us this afternoon if you're located here in, in Ottawa and Canada. Uh, welcome to Cardiac Rehabilitation Rounds. I'm Jennifer Reed, the Program Chair of Cardiac Rehabilitation at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. Last year, we launched this round series with presentations every other month focusing on international researchers to increase knowledge translation and strengthen collaborations in cardiovascular prevention rehabilitation, both within and outside the Heart Institute. Today is our last rounds for the season, so a special one. We will resume again in September. But before we discuss what's ending this season, we are honored to welcome Dr. Kyla Lara Breitinger to this hybrid event, especially as it's a holiday today for you. For her, it's Memorial Day in the United States. So we really appreciate her time this afternoon. We have a hybrid event. We have audience members in person in the Fustinellis Auditorium, as well as online through our Zoom platform. For those in the room, a few housekeeping items and for those online as well before we begin with introductions. For those in the room, any questions following the presentation must be posed using the standing microphone so that audience members here and online can hear you. For those joining us virtually, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature, not the chat. We will also be accepting live questions at the end. Use the hand up feature and you'll be asked to unmute by myself, the moderator. If you're having any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature for those online. Well, without further ado, we must spend a bit of time introducing our speaker this afternoon. It is an honor and a privilege to, um, to host Dr. Kyla Lara Breitinger. She is a senior associate consultant in the Division of Cardiovascular Ultrasound, Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, with a joint appointment in the Division of Preventative Cardiology. She serves as co-director of the Cardiometabolic Clinic. She joined the staff of Mayo Clinic in 2018 and holds the academic rank of Assistant Professor of Medicine, the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science. She earned a BA at the University of California, Berkeley, her MS, Master's of Science in Human Nutrition at Columbia University in New York, and her medical degree at Rush Medical College in Chicago. She completed internal medicine residency, the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York, followed by general cardiology fellowship and advanced fellowships in echocography and preventative cardiology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Her research focuses on investigating dietary patterns in cardiovascular disease mitigation, cardiometabolic disease, and tricuspid regurgitation. She has given presentations to both national and international audiences and has authored journal articles, book chapters, and abstracts. In recognition of her work, she was recognized with the 2001 Paul Dudley White International Scholar Award for the highest ranked abstract submitted to the American Heart Association Scientific Session from the U.S. and the 2023 Mayo Cardiovascular Prospective Award on the Weight of Cardiovascular Disease, a prospective pilot study of obese adults with cardiovascular disease evaluated in a non-cardiometabolic clinic. In addition to her clinic and research activities, Dr. Lara Breitinger is active in the recruitment for the Cardiovascular Disease Fellowship Education and also serves as a mentor to residents and fellows. She also is quite active in a number of colleges and memberships, including the American College of Cardiology, European Society of Cardiology, and the National Lipid Association. Impressive. And that's why we're so thrilled to have you here this afternoon. So without further ado, I would like to invite our speaker to start us off focusing on cardiovascular uh, disease and uh, you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed, for that wonderful introduction. Sometimes it's hard to hear someone introduce yourself. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's a great pleasure and I feel honored to be invited to give this talk today on something that I'm absolutely passionate about. Um, this is us here at the Mayo Clinic at our Gonda building. I have, no contra I have no disclosures other than that I definitely understand that diet is a very controversial topic and diet can be talked about for hours, so this is not meant to be comprehensive to include everything. And so the learning objectives I'd like to talk about today are to review the currently most discussed dietary controversies associated with cardiovascular disease, and to really differentiate healthy plant-based dietary patterns from diets high in ultra-processed foods. 
And so when I think about nutrition, a while ago, someone told me that there were two types of people, people who eat to live and those who live to eat. So when I think about eating to live, it's really kind of eating food to sustain life, to then think about other things in your day, to have purpose, et cetera, versus people who live to eat, which sometimes, you know, many of us can relate to thinking about that next meal being consumed by the following um, being consumed by the following um, meal that you're going to have and really not having the space to think about much anything else. And when I, when I did some research, it's not going, um, the person who actually um, had this quote, thou should eat to live, not live to eat, was by the great Greek philosopher Socrates. Um, and when you look at some interpretations on what he meant by this, he really was focusing on the human species should not be engaging in hedonistic activities, self-indulgences, and should really do the basics to maintain life, to then um, free up mental space to contribute to society. And so that brings us to the evolution of the human species. And here we see over the course of you know, history that we really started out as these hunter-gatherer species where there were periods of fast and famine versus abundance when you had a big hunt and when there were crops around. And there was a lot of periods of fasting with much physical activity. And we've really evolved into a human species, unfortunately, as to the right with that new phenotype of our body habitus, right, where we kind of carry all of that body fat around our abdomen. And this is data from the World Obesity Atlas from 2023. And what I want to point out is that the first column is 2020 and the last column is 2035. And you see the trajectory of people across the globe with overweight, overweight or obesity going from 38% to 51%. One in every two people will be overweight or obese by 2035. And the proportion of people with just obesity, which is defined currently as a BMI of at least 30, is going to go from 14% to 24%. And so I did some looking at the Canadian statistics for obesity and this trajectory, also from the same data source from the World Obesity Atlas. And the trends and the prevalence of obesity will also increase in Canada to 2035 with almost 50% of Canadians living with obesity with that annual increase of obesity being 2.3% annually occurring now. And the really concerning um, data point is that childhood obesity increase, irrespective of being a boy or a girl, will also increase 3.1%. But when I know about our American statistics, this is an old statistic comparing America versus Canada. America outpaces obesity, even in our CDC um, statistics, where we are very obese when it, across the board in terms of total people, men and women, and in obesity class three, which is a BMI of 40 or higher, or previously known as morbid obesity, the United States has almost twice the percentage of people with obesity class three as compared with Canadians. And so when I think about why this has occurred, I really think about this convenience culture that is really the consequence or maybe, you know, from the benefit of science, technology, um, the pandemic, um, putting us in our homes, leading more sedentary lifestyles, maybe more stress of thinking about how we're going to get things done while the kids are at home. And really the convenience aspect where you can have your groceries delivered to you, you could have food prepared and delivered to you, where really the mental effort and physical effort is not there, where we're getting highly caloric foods and nutritionally not dense foods as well. And so I think about really convenience culture and how that has affected our obesogenic society and communities. In the ideal world, this is what we would like, right? We have a very happy couple. They don't look stressed at all. They have time to go shopping for these beautiful cruciferous vegetables and fruits in a beautiful kitchen. So probably not low socioeconomic status has all of the resources that they need to live a healthy lifestyle. So this is what we imagine in our utopian society that everybody can achieve, right? But in reality, I have a Midwest farmer, right? And he works all day and he's eaten red meat his whole life. So I can't push a plant-based diet on him necessarily off the bat or a single mother who works two jobs, has two children. I can't expect her to meal prep with a bunch of perishable food items and also um, make food toddler specific so that they'll eat and also make food for her that everybody can enjoy that is healthy. 
busy executives that do a lot of traveling, I see a lot of patients who the biggest barrier is not having time to think about how they're going to eat food because they're constantly traveling, they're um, entertaining clients, and they're at steakhouses, you name it, and it's very challenging to make good food choices. And lastly, the example I want to highlight is our elderly population who might not live independently, and they really rely on where they live and who is bringing food to them for their nutrition. So sometimes giving them dietary advice may not be relatable to them at all. And so let's move on to the nutritional controversies now. So I don't know if any of you saw this earlier this year at the American Heart Association's Epi Lifestyle Conference, but there was an abstract that really gave quite a bang about the eight hour time restricted eating that was linked to a 91% higher risk of cardiovascular death. So this was, you know, stirred a lot of controversy, okay? It was pretty wild out there. And when you look at the data, it was good data from our NHANES. It's a large perspective American um, cohort study where we follow longitudinally um, American adults, over 20,000 adults. This was really based on only two 24-hour dietary recalls and not much more. It was an eight-year follow-up, which is pretty good. And they found a hazard ratio of 1.96 and that this is compared to eating in a 12 to 16 hour window versus an eight hour window. But when you look at their data, you see that in the group with less than eight hours that linked to a higher risk of cardiovascular death, there was only 414 participants in there, which really is only 2% of the entire study sample. So not really a good conclusion to give out to the world um, when this was really the data that they supplied. And so when it comes to intermittent fasting, which I'll talk about first, they mitigate and slow age, um, aging and disease modification. The New England Journal of Medicine has a really wonderful review paper on intermittent fasting and all of these cellular pathways that modulate disease and um, prevent and slow down disease progression through multiple different pathways that I'll highlight. The increase in stress resistance and reduced inflammation and reduced free radical production. These three things are really important in preventing atherosclerosis, a lot of um, cancers and malignancies through the free radical production, and then obviously weight loss, glucagon, uh, glucose regulation, and insulin sensitivity with intermittent fasting and being more efficient with utilization of ATP, which is the body's main energy source. And so when it comes to intermittent fasting, there it's an umbrella term for multiple different um, regimens that one can follow. There's alternate day fasting, which is what the name means. So every other day, really reducing your calor calories. There's a five and two where a patient can select two days out of the week to fast. And the more popular is a daily time restricted feeding where you choose a six to 10, 10 hour feeding window and the 24 hours and then you fast the rest. This by far is the most tolerable by most people and sustainable. And what the data shows in both mirroring models, um, perspective trials, you know, with um, limited data is that there are improvements in these cardiometabolic risk factors and parameters, like an improvement in your blood pressure, your resting heart rate, your HDL and LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, and insulin resistance. They've also been shown to reduce markers of systemic inflammation, like your high sensitivity CRP and the and oxidative stress associated with the atherosclerosis. And you can see these improvements in these um, parameters within two to four weeks of adopting one of these regimens. And so we'll move on to it's not just what we eat, but when we eat, right? What time of the day are we eating? So when we think about time restricted feeding, there's something called circadian rhythm, which is basically your internal clock of when your sleep and wake cycle is. And there are disruptors that have been defined. So our night shift workers who are up at night and maybe eating at night when we have different hormones like ghrelin, which increases our appetite, our highest or at their peak. Um, social jet lag is a concept of on the weekends, people sleeping later, binge drinking later in the night and waking up later the next day can be a big disruptor. Night eating, I don't know if all of us have this beautiful fridge with just only healthy options to choose from and that's what we go for at night when we're eating these beautiful tomatoes but night eating as well. And also depending on your lifestyle, work, stress, you might be skipping meals. And so how does that affect this idea of chrononutrition or how we eat relative to time? And so it's just something for us to reflect about. 
And so they did a study, a five-week study, looking at non-obese patients or adults with early versus midday time restricted feeding with ad libitum eating. So this is basically eating whatever you want. There's no recommendations on what you should eat. You just have to follow the early, which is eating from 6 a.m. and stopping and eating your last meal at 3 p.m. versus mid, selecting any eight-hour window between 11 a.m. and 8 p.m. And what they found was that the earlier you ate and the earlier you stopped eating, you had improved insulin sensitivity and fasting glucose, reduced total body mass and adiposity based on your DEXA scan and how you distribute fat versus skeletal muscle, a decrease in inflammation in your TNF alpha and IL-8. There was no difference in high sensitivity CRP and really more diverse gut microbiome. But as you can tell, we live in a culture, a social culture where food culture is really center. So it would be really difficult for a lot of patients and a lot of us to stop eating at 3 p.m., especially if we work till 5 p.m., have a family and want to um, um, get together and have dinner with one another. The, I'm probably butchering this, but the Nutrinet Santé, which is a French prospective cohort of adults, um, also looked at dietary circadian rhythms and chrononutrition. And what they found was that the later you had your first meal and the later you had your last meal, you were going to have more association with cardiovascular disease and stroke. These associations were stronger in women. And so the recommendation is against breakfast skipping and late night eating. They also found that Younger people, single people, people with higher education, people who binge drink, people with lower socioeconomic status, all adopted eating their first meal later and their last meal even later. And so Jack really um, put this review paper out on this concept of a pesco Mediterranean diet with intermittent fasting. So you see here on the right, the typical Mediterranean diet where the eating window is really from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., that green at the bottom that you see there. And really the diet should be plants, nuts, fish, and seafood. Supplemented fat source should be extra virgin olive oil with moderate dairy consumption and eggs, moderate alcohol consumption, and then really restricting your feeding with two meals rather than three meals in that compressed window. There has not been a randomized control trial for this, just this review paper from 2020, but it'll be really interesting to see if we can do an intervention to see if this is really the best way to eat for uh, cardioprotective health. And so the cardioprotective dietary patterns that I think we all know are the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension, and plant-based diets. We know from much research that the benefits for cardiovascular disease are really the result of reducing that low-density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol levels, and really the degree of reduction is proportional to the extent of how much we reduce that LDL cholesterol. So you get more benefit in getting that LDL cholesterol down um, with your cardiovascular risk. And so I'll just briefly um, remind everybody about the PREDIMED study, which is the largest randomized control style for diet on Mediterranean diet in multi-centers in Spain. It was primary prevention, so none of the people had any history of cardiovascular disease. It was around 7,500 adults. The intervention was a Mediterranean diet plus supplementation with nuts, a Mediterranean diet with supplementation of extra virgin olive oil, or a control diet, which was just a low-fat diet. They followed these people for about five years, and they looked at a primary endpoint of a major cardiovascular event. So that's myocardial infarction, stroke, or death from a cardiovascular cause. And they found a five-year relative risk reduction of 30% compared to the control with an absolute difference of 2.1% with extra virgin olive oil reduction and 1.7% reduction with the nuts. So again, this was a positive trial. There were some issues where they had to redo the analysis due to problems with enrollment and um, randomization. But when they redid the analysis, it was still a positively significant study in favor of the Mediterranean diet. The Leon diet heart study is also another large trial, secondary prevention. So these people were adults after they've had their first MI, less than 70 years old. They looked at the Mediterranean diet versus the Western type diet. And they looked at the follow-up of intermediate 27 months to about four years. And they looked at three different outcomes that I'll show here. And really the summary is you see a separation between the Mediterranean or the experimental group and the control group. That separation, if you look at the Y axis, which is percent without event, 
you want to have the highest percent without the event. So at the top, and you see across the board on the left column is cardiovascular death and non-fatal MI. And the middle column is secondary events. So that's unstable angina, stroke, heart failure, and pulmonary embolism. And the third column is going to be minor events that required hospitalization. The experimental group or the Mediterranean group wins in terms of having less events. Okay, so they have a percent with a, a higher percent without an, an, an event in favor of the Mediterranean diet for secondary prevention. So the DASH diet is one of the oldest interventions. This is the original feeding trial here in over 450 free living participants. All the food was provided for the first three weeks. That was the washout period. And then they put people in that square diet, which is the control diet. And then the plus signs are that fruit and vegetables diet or a third diet, which is the fruits and vegetables and um, low fat dairy. And what they found was that the systolic blood pressure at the top and the diastolic blood pressure at the bottom, you see a nice separation where the combination diet or the DASH diet was associated with further reduction in blood pressure in terms of systolic and that diastolic blood pressure. And in those participants with high, high blood pressure, there was an 11.4 millimeter mercury drop in systolic blood pressure and a 5.5 millimeter mercury drop in diastolic blood pressure. And this was observed within two weeks and maintained for the six weeks the trial went on. The unfortunate thing is when you have these patients that are free living out into the world, adherence really drops. And this is across the board for most dietary interventions after a study is done. And so when I have a patient and I think about what diet to tell them to, to follow, I think about them as an individual. Are they very rigid and do they need specific servings per food, per group, per day, because they want a more rigid schedule, or will that overwhelm them? And saying, telling them to eat more versus eat less, avoid, or eat in moderation. And so these two diets have more similarities and differences with the differences really with the DASH diet, having more specific milligrams per day of sodium if your patient has high blood pressure. And then there's not a restriction in the type of alcohol like the Mediterranean diet, which is red wine versus alcohol in the DASH diet is really just a number. And so this is just for your reference here to look at later on. And so I just wanna go through a case that I had, a 56 year old white male, he had a BMI of 26. He had hyperlipidemia in his twenties, a non-smoker, occasional alcohol. His brother had a bypass surgery at the age of 43. So he came into the clinic and I just want to draw your attention. He was on rosuvastatin 20 or rosuvastatin 40 later on, and his triglycerides were out of control, 300, 500. They couldn't calculate his LDL cholesterol because the triglycerides were way too high. And so he came in for a visit for atypical chest pain. He had a stress test, a regadenosine stress test that was negative. He declined our exercise physiologist and dietitian. Then he went to our familial hypercholesterolemia clinic because of, of his very high triglycerides. His genetic tests were negative. He then adopted the ketogenic diet. For nine months, he lost 60 pounds. Then he stopped his statin. And so these are his um, numbers for cholesterol after he stopped his statin, restarted his stopped it. And you see here, his LDL cholesterol is all over the place. Really in December of 2022, when I met him, his cholesterol level was 286 and he was off a of statin. At some point they had checked an LP little a, which is an independent risk marker for atherosclerosis. And that was normal. And also apolipoprotein B, which is a more specific atherogenic marker for cardiovascular disease as well. So we ended up getting a calcium score on him and his calcium score was in the 99th percentile. Unfortunately, he didn't come back after that, despite us telling him that he really needed to get back on a statin. And so that brings us to the ketogenic diet. It's defined as very low carbs, 5% only, high fat, 70 to 80% fat. Most of your macronutrients there you see are coming from fat with only moderate protein. And in order to achieve these macronutrient percentages, you have to eat a lot of saturated fat that are primarily coming from red meat and processed red meat here. 
And even if you don't have a patient on a ketogenic diet, but they're telling you they're having a clean diet, they eat a whole foods diet, make sure to ask them about their coconut oil usage. This is a big mismarketing, um, at least in America, about the positives of coconut oil, but there's enough data out there to show the strong association with coconut oil consumption and an increase in that LDL cholesterol. And so how does ketosis work? So we're gonna go through this one by one, I'm just joking. In summary, if you have a high fat diet, that's gonna cause your fat cells to break down free fatty acids. That's gonna increase the molecule called acetylcholate that if you remember the TCA cycle normally goes there, but then it overwhelms this TCA cycle and then it pushes these into ketosis. And then you get these byproducts of beta-hydroxybutyrate, acetoacetate, and acetone. And so that is by way of ketogenesis and ketosis. And so it's really good, okay, at treating intractable epilepsy. It was, an origin, it was originally treated for drug refractory juvenile epilepsy. It very much successfully treats metabolic syndrome, weight loss, and insulin sensitivity, glucose sensitivity, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and some psychiatric illnesses like bipolar disease, depression, anxiety can really help. And you see this illustration on the right here that shows visceral fat or fat that encases your vital organs as in comparison to subcutaneous fat that is just right behind the skin. And it is this visceral fat that is associated with diabetes, early mortality mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and some malignancies associated with food here. And this is really what the ketogenic diet promises to treat. But however, um, when we think about the ketogenic diet, we talked about the benefits, but it also raises the LDL cholesterol in many people. And so what is the link with ketogenic diet and coronary artery disease? Well, I had a patient who told me that his LDL cholesterol doesn't define his metabolic health. He wanted his apolipoprotein B checked instead, which is a more specific, as I said, risk marker for atherogenesis because it's one-to-one -one in terms of LDL particle with one apolipoprotein B. He wanted his LDL-C particle size looked at. The bigger and plumpier your LDL particle size, the less atherogenic and the smaller or stickier your LDL cholesterol is, the more atherogenic it is. There's some concept of a lean mass hyperresponder phenotype where these are lean individuals by BMI and they have a pronounced response in their lipids. So their LDL cholesterol after they've adopted a ketogenic diet soars above 200 and they really have that um, tight ratio of HDL to triglyceride level as well. But the irrefutable facts that we already talked about is the increase in LDL cholesterol leads to coronary disease. And what is known is that in patients who have coronary disease, each one millimole per liter or 39 point decrease results in a 20% relative reduction in cardiovascular mortality and myocardial infarction. And so there have been a few studies, the keto, um, the keto crossover with the Mediterranean Plus diet that looked it was looked at in 2022 in the Bay Area. And both of these diets recommended a non-starchy vegetables, um, avoiding added sugars and avoiding refined grains. The keto diet avoided healthy legumes, fruits, and whole intact grains, while the Mediterranean promoted these legumes, fruits, whole intact grains. As we discussed, the keto diet was low carb, high fat with moderate protein. Both of them, after 12 weeks, reduced the same hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker for diabetes. They both decrease weight, and they both increase that happy or healthy cholesterol, that HDL cholesterol. However, the ketogenic diet had an increase in LDL cholesterol. It was good news with a decrease in triglycerides, but they also had a decrease in those essential nutrients, the so fiber, folate, vitamin C, and magnesium, where the Mediterranean diet had an abundance in these. But when it comes to a diet, we have to ask, which diet was sustainable? Well, they surveyed these participants. The people who were put in the keto diet complained of brain fog, hangry or irritability. So hangry, for those of you who don't know, I think we all do, is when you're so hungry, it makes you angry. Um, fatigue, low mood, and headaches, where the Mediterranean diet was sustainable. And so when we think about um, this diet, we want to know, is, that, is there coronary plaque and how is there vascular health? 
but there's no data yet. The only data they have are the intima um, carotid media thickness in juveniles that were put on this diet for epilepsy. And really the results have been equivocal and you really would have to be on this diet for decades because most people develop atherosclerosis in the later decades of life. And so you really wouldn't be able to pragmatically get CTAs on everyone and maintain people on these diets. It would be very expensive, but some people are in the works of developing studies like this to find find out more strong data. And so is there a healthier keto diet? We have some extra virgin olive oil, salmon. We know that red wine has resveratrol, which is an active metabolite in anti-inflammation and antioxidants, and then these cruciferous vegetables. And well, there was, there is, and there, there was a study called the Spanish ketogenic Mediterranean diet, where the main components were greater than 30 milliliters of extra virgin olive oil per day, 200 to 400 milliliters of red wine per day, green vegetables and salads as the main source of carbohydrates and fish as a main source of protein. And what they found in these obese individuals that they all decreased their BMI with weight loss. They all had improvement in their diastolic blood pressure. Their lipid panels improved, including their LDL cholesterol with these healthier forms of mono and polyunsaturated fats and their HDL increase as well. If you're like me and you don't know how much, how many milliliters is 30 millimeters and 200 to 40 milliliters of, of red wine, well, it's about two, at least two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil and three glasses of red wine per day. Now, more and more data is coming out that any amount of alcohol is not healthy for you anymore, but this is what this study showed. When we think about extra virgin olive oil as opposed to regular olive oil or virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil means that it is least processed. So the oil during its preparation was not heated to extract the oil. So then you have more polyphenols and antioxidants. So really you could do a taste test. Extra virgin olive oil has a sweeter taste and it has more of a taste. And that means that it's not, it hasn't been heated to be processed. And what about red meat, unprocessed red meat? We have beef, pork, veal, lamb, sheep, and gay meat. And then we have this processed red cured meat, okay? So that's any meat that has been processed to be packaged. And when we look at all the data, all of the data are really prospective observational cohort studies. They all assume this dose responsive hazard ratio per unit of exposure. So it's this log linear relationship. It compares extreme categories from not eating any to eating a lot. And so there are questions, right? Does the relationship with eating unprocessed red meat stop after you eat? have higher doses. And there's a lot of between study heterogeneity, which means the quality of different observational studies are so varied, it's hard to really make any summer, um, any conclusions actually. So there was a study in Nature Medicine. It was a big study in 2022. They did a burden of proof study in health effects that are associated associated with unprocessed red meat. And they looked at these six different health outcomes that are associated with red meat. Breast cancer, colorectal cancer, type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, strokes, both ischemic and hemorrhagic. And they, what they did was they ranked all of these studies they found with evidence of association, with one star being really no association, with strong association, very strong. And really, it's a really prolonged data analysis. But the summary was that for all the six outcomes, the risk was zero um, at zero grams per day of unprocessed red meat. However, the association was weak. There's no really randomized control trials looking at unprocessed red meat versus not. When it came to the average intake versus no intake with ischemic heart disease, there was a 1% increase intake with um, intake of the unprocessed meat. And you have their colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Those are associated with red meat consumption. You see that six and three percent and type two diabetes is one percent. So really not enough data is a summary I have to say to a patient who enjoys unprocessed red meat, who's a farmer and who has other vices like ultra processed foods, I wouldn't necessarily go for the un unprocessed red meat as opposed to other things if there are other opportunities, especially with the weak data, but also knowing there is a lot of saturated fat even in some unprocessed red meats. So then is any amount of meat healthy? I always look at this little pig. We know pigs are more intelligent than dogs. And I think about would anybody wanna eat this little piggy? 
And so there was a study done recently that we'll get into on the next slide, but identical twin studies in general, when we're thinking about doing a dietary study to look at an intervention, twins are the perfect example, right? Twins share genetic environmental factors. As long as um, they weren't separated at birth, they have nearly identical DNA. They have shared upbringing and exposures, and it's the most ideal for studying dietary effect alone. And so there was an eight week randomized trial looking at 22 pairs of twins. They were randomized to a healthy omnivorous, so both meat and vegetables only, or a vegan diet. For the first four weeks, they were provided all their meals. And then for the following four weeks, they had to grocery shop and cook their own meals. The primary outcome they looked at was really a change in their LDL cholesterol, with secondary outpoints, looking at the diversity in their gut microbiome, some other things like your HDL, cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, insulin, and B12. And what they found was that the baseline age or the mean age was 40, predominantly female and predominantly white. This was also in the Bay Area. And what they found here in the reduction of the mean LDL cholesterol was that the vegan group one, you see 116.1 versus 95.5, which is a difference estimate of 13.9. And really the, both of these groups are relatively healthy. Their baseline LDL cholesterols were, were 114. When it came to the secondary outcomes, Fasting insulin was in favor of veganism. Body weight was also in favor of veganism. And then the non-significant, which is really no difference between the two groups, was HDL cholesterol, B12, which strict vegans need to intake as a supplement, TMAO, which is a byproduct um, from your gut um, metabolization. TMAO has been found in higher concentrations in people who eat red meat and have had higher um, evidence of atherosclerosis in their coronary arteries, but a little bit controversial. And then also triglycerides were non-significant as well. So then when we want to see, well, why was the omnivorous diet not as good as the vegan diet? We have to see, well, what were they intaking? So the daily animal targets were six to eight ounces of meat, fish, or poultry, an egg per day, and one and a half servings of dairy per day. Their other targets were five servings of fruits and vegetables combined with six servings of grain or starchy vegetables. And when we look at the supplement, the baseline is the first column, food delivery is the second column, self-provided is the third column. The omnivorous diet had about one and a half eggs per day. They had two to three servings of, of um, chicken per day or poultry, and the beef was almost two servings per day. So you wonder, maybe if we took out the beef or cut back the eggs, could have the LDL cholesterol been more comparable? So plant-based diets, another umbrella term that can include vegetarianism, which is a restriction of meat, poultry, and fish, but can include a blend of dairy, eggs, and honey, like ovo-lacto, ovo, or lacto, vegetarian. Vegans, you want to avoid all animal products, including honey. And the whole food plant-based diet is really encouraging a lifestyle of minimally processed foods in all of the categories. But not all plant-based diets are the same. There was a big study looking at the nurses' health study and health professional follow-up study, and they, they categorized plant-based indices into an overall plant-based index, a healthy plant-based index, and an unhealthy plant-based index. And it's probably what you think, right? So the unhealthy plant-based index had a 32% increased risk in coronary heart disease, whereas the healthy plant-based index is a 25% decrease risk. So you can tell there's still good and bad within um, someone who adopts a vegan or a vegetarian diet. And very interestingly, one study found that vegetarians and vegans consume more ultra-processed foods, and adults who initiate meat-free diets at a younger age were more likely to include ultra-processed foods in their diet. So some concerning findings there. So, you know, there's been an explosion of meat alternatives or meat analogs that they are vegan and they're meant to taste like meat. Really, currently, there's limited evidence of their health effects. We know that they're ultra processed with added sugar, saturated fat, salt, stabilizers and preservatives. All of these things improve the palate. They are more palatable. They can last longer in your freezer, in your pantry. They're all associated with greater caloric intake and weight gain. In order for these plant burgers to taste like meat, they have to contain heme iron in them. But heme iron has also been associated with increased risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, colorectal cancer, and lung cancer as well. 
And the last thing I ask my patients are, well, if you're having this, you know, meat analog, what are you eating it? What kind of bun are you eating it? Are you eating it with French fries, chips, versus the salad. So is something neutralizing the health effects? So just something to think about when we think about these plant-based meat analogs in our diets. So that brings me to, if there's one thing I want you guys all to take home is ultra processed foods, okay? So that's in everything, okay? So pizza, burgers, bagels with cream cheese, salty potato chips, sodas, pop, that's what they call it here in the Midwest. So they provide 60% of the total energy in the American diet, over 60% of the total energy in our diet. So ultra processed foods are based on something called a NOVA classification system. So to be ultra pop, um, ultra processed, it's a NOVA 4 classification. So that means they contain no or minimally whole foods. They're produced with substances extracted from foods or made in laboratories. So that includes dye, flavorings, preservatives. So all of these um, sub um, artificial things that we're eating, they're meant to cause us to be addicted to food. They can last in the pantry. There are things you could take out of the pantry in six months or one year, and they still taste good asking for more. Um, with the exception of like beans and pastas and whole grains that are left in the pantry. And so there was a Framingham offspring study looking at over 3,000 American adults. They collected data in the early 90s to early 2000s with follow-up 10 to 20 years later. And then what they found at baseline was the average American adult intake seven and a half servings, seven and a half servings per day of ultra processed foods at baseline. And what they found that on top of the seven and a half servings of baseline, each additional serving was associated with a five to 9% overall cardiovascular disease risk and mortality. So that is very concerning. So if there's one thing we could recommend to anybody and everybody is if you can identify someone or yourself who eats a lot of ultra processed foods is starting to minimize and cut back on that and avoid and to replace with non ultra processed foods. So we're going to switch over here for the last part and looking at atrial fibrillation and extra virgin olive oil because this has come into um, the media and um, amongst all of us, especially if you're watching the Heart Rhythm Society May 2024 conference. And so the original PrediMed, they looked at incidental atrial fibrillation with that supplementation with olive oil versus nuts versus a placebo. And you see in the green, the Mediterranean diet with extra virgin olive oil has a lower incidence of atrial fibrillation over the six year follow-up compared to the control and compared with the Mediterranean nuts. And the late breaking trial, oh, and that was about a 38% relative risk reduction. So the late breaking trial just this month at the Heart, um, the Heart Rhythm Society in May of 2024 this year was the Predimar study. And say, they looked at atrial fibrillation after ablation in these patients. And they looked at Mediterranean diet versus control. They didn't see um, a, a significance with overall atrial fibrillation, but in the patients who had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation after ablation, there was a significant difference in um, recurrence of tachyarrhythmias of a relative risk reduction of 31% in favor of a Mediterranean diet. So then that leads everybody to thinking, well, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation is where it's at. I won't go through all of this. This is all for your reference to look at later if you'd like the slides, but basically really mixed data with the last study, the strength study, it was terminated early. It was originally meant to be a 42 month study because they found no difference in um, supplementation with omega-3 fatty acids. So in summary, I tell patients who are taking over the counter omega-3 fatty acids to really focus on dietary patterns that I already showed that are abundant omega-3 fatty acids rather than starting patients on supplementation and you'll save cost and money as, as well for patients as well. So in, in summary for the fish and fish oil, we really want to aim for two servings of fish per week. There have been review studies looking at any increase, incremental increase in servings of fish, can they offer more cardiovascular protection? And they really don't beyond that two servings of fish unless you're replacing um, red meat with fish if you have a strong red meat eater. non prescription fish oil is not recommended for primary or secondary prevention. And really in these two categories, when you have really bad hypertriglyceridemia greater than 500, 
you could have the purified um, VASEPA, which is purified EPA of about four grams per day. Or if you have a high cardiovascular disease risk with all of those CV risk enhancers, and then you're on high dose statin and you still have moderately increased triglycerides greater than 150, you could then consider a purified EPA as well. So again, stay away from the supplements for fish oil over the counter and yes to omega-3 fatty acid food sources. And so vitamins, how many of you guys take vitamins out there? Well, we really shouldn't be taking vitamins. The essential nutrient requirements state, it really, we, the variety of foods is much superior than nutrient supplementations in the USA and most developed countries. All of our food is fortified with the vitamins that we need. Over half of Americans take at least one vitamin or dietary supplement per day, which results in a $31 billion spent each year just on vitamins. And we know that we excrete most of the vitamins we even intake um, in our urine. And really, there's only a short list of recommended, recommended vitamins. So those um, prenatal and perinatal women, folic acid to reduce fetal neural tube defects. For strict vegans, you really need B12 for red cell production. And then calcium and vitamin D to reduce the risk of osteoporosis. There was some association with a possible link to stroke, but some of that still needs to be deciphered. So really stay away from vitamins, eat a more balanced diet if it is possible. So in summary, we really want to adjust our energy intake and expenditure to achieve and maintain a healthy body weight and really adhere to the following, regardless of whether we're eating out with friends this is our very busy and huge Rochester International Airport, as you can see here. It's a very, very small airport, actually. Um, whether you're at home and you've had a rough day or, you know, you're going through something, you, we really want to, as much as possible, do everything in green on the left and really avoid and limit everything in the red. So we want to eat a variety of fruits and cruciferous cruciferous vegetables. So those dark leafy green vegetables that have all of those nutrients in them, whole grain fruits and products, liquid plant oils, which, you know, we're just going to summarize here, but that can include more than extra virgin olive oil, the seed oils like soybean oil, corn out, corn oil, safflower, sunflower flax, you know, walnut oil, um, avocado oil. Those are all healthy oils with low saturated fat content. Plant protein, so legumes and nuts, fish and seafood, which we talked about, low fat and fat free dairy, and lean, unprocessed meat and poultry, and really focusing on minimally processed foods and really avoiding all of the processed meats, fatty cuts of meats. They have things like nitrates in them and salts that are stabilizers. And those have all been kind of shown to be associated with increased mortality and metabolic syndromes and kind of endocrine disruptors. You know, foods prepared with high salt and sodium, we obviously want to reduce blood pressure since we know that stroke and heart disease are the major causes of death later in life. We want to reduce tropical oils or eliminate them completely. So those include coconut oil, palm oils, palm kernel oils, partially hydrogenated fats and trans fats. In America, trans fats were finally uh, made illegal or banned, I should say. Um, avoid and limiting additive sugars in our beverages and foods, ultra processed foods, and again, alcohol. There's more and more data to suggest that any amount of alcohol is not good for us at all. But knowing that we're in a food culture, you know, uh, the current dietary recommendations are still less than two drinks per day in men and less than one drink per day in women. And so thank you very much. I'd like to leave this um, uh, epic message I got. I'm, as as um, Dr. Reed mentioned, I'm from California. I did medical school in Chicago and I did my master's and my residency in New York City. So I moved to the Midwest and, you know, I hadn't been around farmers as much. And so this is a really sweet message from an elk hunter I saw in November last year who um, felt like we were able to meet in the middle. Um, he was younger, he, his um, risk score wasn't that high. And we talked about other ways to adopt changes in his diet while letting him still be an elk hunter and um, eat different things that he enjoyed. So thank you very much. Well, that was a fabulous presentation. And I use the word fabulous as I received a text from a colleague in capital letters saying, what a fabulous talk this is. 
Um, so I, I want to thank you again on behalf of everyone in the room and, and virtually for such a fabulous presentation. What I'll do now is I'll just do a bit of housekeeping for our Q&A and for the rounds table tomorrow, just in case anyone does have to leave, they have that information with them. And then once I summarize, we'll move right into the Q&A period for the time that's left. Um, so just a reminder, there is a round table discussion tomorrow. It's virtual, it's online, it's meant to be an informal discussion for um, Dr. Laura Breidinger. So if you have questions, you are also all welcome to attend the round table session tomorrow. You can find the specific registration link in the advertisement that went out for the presentation this afternoon. A reminder for the Q&A for those live in the audience, um, please make your way to the microphone and we'll begin taking questions. If you are online, I will do my best to answer all of, or not answer, pose the questions that are provided in the Q&A and we'll make our way through as much as we can within the remaining minutes. And then if not, we will move to the round table discussion tomorrow. Um, I also did want to point out we had nearly 300 registrants for the talk today, which is very impressive. So let's see what we can do in the next few minutes with getting through Q&A. So if anyone's in the audience that wants to ask, just make yourself um, over to the microphone and I'll begin here with the, the live questions. I'm wondering if you can just give a bit more information on what is early time restricted feeding, if you're able to review that. Absolutely. So the concept of um, time restricted feeding in general is a form of intermittent fasting, which is basically deciding a period of time in your day you're going to fast. And so time restricted feeding is the most tolerated for people who are starting out, right? So you're basically choosing the hours in a day anywhere from six to eight, ideally, in a day where you will eat. And the rest of the time outside of that window, you are not eating, you're fasting. And so that helps with the more efficient energy metabolism and those periods of ketosis for your body to kind of like clear out the garbage, they say, to be more efficient instead of processing and kind of, you know, building on and storing more energy that we don't really need in the course of the day. So early time restricted feeding as opposed to mid or late is deciding, well, what hours in the day am I going to choose? Most people that I know tend to eat their window between 12 p.m. and 8 p.m. Because it's very easy if you're working to skip breakfast, to have a black coffee that's not considered caloric, and then to then eat dinner, and then knowing you're going to get off at maybe five or six to make sure you have your last bite before 8 p.m. So that is more of a mid mid time restricted feeding. The early, okay, that I, you know, there's anti aging diets. There's so many diets out there, right? You can look on Google and find any diet that you're partial to, and you'll find one that resonates. Well, there's an anti-aging diet and there's these caloric restriction diets where they have an earlier time restricted feeding. So they will stop eating by 3 p.m. and they will start eating by like 6 a.m. And so you would have to know and mitigate and negotiate with yourself like, is it possible for me to stop eating at 3 p.m.? Because based on your circadian rhythm, in terms of your gut and brain hormones interacting, especially ghrelin, your ghrelin peaks in the evening. And that is when that ghrelin is an increase or an appetite stimulant. That's when you'll overeat, right? So we definitely know lower, lower socioeconomic status, higher rates of people working at night there. And they tend to be more obese and overweight with worse sleep wake cycles and people who are awake during the day and who have work involved during the day. And so if you're somebody who can, it's not pragmatic to stop eating at 3 p.m., but maybe 5 p.m. even to slowly shift your time of having your last meal earlier and earlier without it um, interfering with your quality of life. I think it's a balance of quality of life and longevity that we're answering here when it comes to picking the time period. So I hope that answers it. That that does. Thank you. Okay, we have a sex specific question. I'm I'm happy to see this. It's from a friend and colleague, Dr. Tice Catino. It says, thank you for this wonderful overview. Are you aware of data regarding sex specific effects of intermittent fasting? 
on one hand, females are evolutionary better at storing energy and may, may deal better with the physiological stress of fasting. But on the other hand, we know that severe caloric restriction causes hormonal changes and amenorrhea. So does the female body go into panic mode with intermittent fasting? Thais, that is a fantastic question for you, Joel. So I'm not aware if anyone has actually looked at the data um, in large cohorts of women versus men and in intermittent fasting. I think that would be extremely interesting. Maybe you and I should do it at Mayo. Um, but, you know, it, it it's interesting, right? Because we know that amenorrhea um, is a problem. And so we, that wouldn't be a good patient to obviously put through intermittent fasting. But I think women in general who are premenstrual or in menopause, you know, looking at anti-inflammatory diets in addition to caloric restriction, that actually helps with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So I think if your substrate and your phenotype is overweight and you're in excess, then I think intermittent fasting can actually improve the regulation. You know, if we're thinking about, you know, throwing women on an island and who's going to live longer longer um, with fasting, then I think someone who has um, higher fat deposit stores are going to make it longer. And there's also anecdotal evidence on that. But I think that's a fascinating question is if we looked more at the different hormone levels of women and categorize them and stratify them based on their BMI and their age, whether they're pre, peri, or postmenopausal. Thank you for coming, Thais. <laughs> We're not going to let her ask the second question because I want to um, answer as many questions as possible, but we can connect afterwards. Um, can you comment on the link between dietary sugar and cardiovascular disease, aside from the risk of increased calories and obesity? Yes. And so, you know, when it comes to, so can you comment on the link between dietary sugar and cardiovascular disease, aside from the risk of increased calories and obesity? You know, and that's a great question. I think you know, aside from calories and obesity, carbohydrates, it depends on what type of carbohydrates we're talking about. It looks like your question is dietary sugar or added sugar. And we know very well that added sugar is associated with insulin um, dysregulation, your, glu your glucose response instead of your glycemic index, et cetera. But the more dietary sugar you have, postprandial, you have this spike in your glycine in this glucose response. And then your insulin has to kind of mitigate that to get that back this homeostasis. And I think, you know, um, when it comes to sugar, people who are normal weight still can get diabetes. And it's really the mitigation of the added sugar that prevents that, especially if they have a genetic predisposition. So I think obesity and um, cardiovascular disease is a main public health concern across the globe because sugar is causing obesity and cardiovascular disease. But aside from that, I think it's the diabetes portion as well. Okay, I'm going to try to fit in two final questions. If you've sent questions um, and we don't have time today, what we'll do is we'll move all those to the round table tomorrow as we've got lots of questions and they're still coming in. So thank you, everyone. Um, so first question is, how about oils like avocado or hemp? Are they healthy? Yeah, and that's a great question. And so and that brings me back to stating that, you know, if everyone decided to have extra virgin olive oil in the world, there wouldn't be enough extra virgin olive oil and olive groves to supply that to every single person in the globe. And so really it's finding what makes sense for you in terms of cost local and what you grow around you. And so thinking about the different oils in general, seed oils are in general, okay and healthy to eat. So that would include avocado oil and hemp oil. You want to stay away from the palm, the palm kernel oils, et cetera, but canola oil, sesame oil, flaxseed oil. They're just not as um, uh, popular. They're more kind of hip and you can find them probably in Berkeley or in other kind of small um, places, but there are more than just extra virgin olive oil and vegetable oil and canola oil. I mean, canola oil is under appreciated as a cheaper alternative that is is not bad for you in terms of cooking as well. Extra virgin olive oil, because it's Mediterranean and it tastes good. And I have a, I'm partial to the Mediterranean because I love it um, and it tastes good, but um, there is more than Mediterranean oil, yes. Okay, great, thank you. And that addresses a comment that just came in regarding palm oil. Okay, I'll ask this last question and see how quickly you can respond to it. <laughs> You discussed the eight hour time restricted eating study linked to 91% higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Appreciated your critique of this, but wondering what you think might be key confounders here. Could it be that these 2% are breakfast skippers? Other ideas? 
Yeah, and that is an excellent question. And I think the problem, which is not, it's not a critique of dietary um, studies and analysis. It's just the nature of being able to successfully do a randomized clinical dietary intervention trial over a long period over a year is so costly. And how are you going to control that these people for an entire year are only going to eat what you advise them to versus what you supply them with, which costs money. And so people take from the NHANES data, which is a great source and milieu of information, but then when you pull the data and you ask them two questionnaires about the time they eat, less than eight hours or 12 to 16 hours, and you're trying to submit an abstract for publication, you're going to find where you're going to get a hazard ratio and a tick. But then what you want to make sure that we're careful of is that these are really preliminary. There's still no manuscript for this study. But what I read when I carefully read through the abstract is that, you know, we this is a, these are good questions. Are they breakfast skippers? Other ideas. And it, you know, the, um, the French cohort, the prospective cohort, as I showed right after this one, show that the younger you are, if you're single and you don't have a family, if you tend to stay out late, that makes more sense, right? You're waking up late, you're eating late. That means you have other unhealthy behaviors. So this is probably all confounded by other lifestyle factors that are not being, um, kind of adjusted for in their analysis. Thank you for such a comprehensive uh, analysis, speculation of, of some of those potential count confounders. So I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Laura Bredinger, on behalf of the University of Ottawa Heart Institute and our weekly research round series. Thank you for such a superb presentation this afternoon. We will find you tomorrow online at noon, a rather informal group discussion. For those online and in person, a reminder, this is our last cardiac rehabilitation round series for the year. We will regroup back in September, so keep your eyes peeled. Um, for announcements for the coming fall with our next rounds of speakers. So thank you everyone and uh, enjoy your Monday and your holiday and your holiday Monday. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you.